tonight, I wanted to speak to you uh, about the Roman road of salvation. Uh, you know, this is something that is really, really dear to me because um, I've seen it, you know, how it worked and how it helped people to lead them to Christ. Amen. Um, and uh, I was taught in Bible study in Sunday school as I was growing up. <clears throat> I was taught the Roman road of, of salvation. So tonight I wanted to just touch on it uh, to because last uh, uh, Sunday we spoke about the, the, the Great Commission and um, how we should be witnessing and spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. But tonight I want to talk about what happens when you get with that person or when you start to witness to them. It, it doesn't have to be all in order like we're going to do tonight, but you can use it as a guideline, okay? When you're speaking to someone or, or you're trying to share your faith, uh, about uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ and salvation, how a person can become saved. So this is just a guideline. You allow the Holy Spirit to move you um, and, and give you the words to say. Uh, you pray that the Holy Spirit would give you those words um, when you're witnessing to someone, when you're talking to someone about Jesus Christ. But here, I just want to give you a guideline. And normally we use, and I, a lot of Christians have been taught, uh, I was taught uh, in, in Sunday school and Bible study about the Roman roles of salvation when it comes to sharing my faith with other people and unbelievers. So the Roman road to salvation is uh, a selection of Bible verses know you know taken from the books of Rome taken from the book of Romans um, that presents the plan of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ amen you can you can memorize these verses you know or you can mark them in your Bible and use them when you uh, are sharing your faith with with family and with friends if you have not yet confessed and believe on Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, please listen tonight and consider the meaning of each verse and act accordingly. It's important that we know the word of God. So as we, can, as we encounter our scriptures tonight, let us consider the thought, the Roman road. To salvation. Okay. The, the first one, if, and, and keep your Bibles open because we're going to go be, be, we're going to be going through Roman, you know, the book of Romans. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to our first scripture, which is Romans 3, 23, Romans chapter three, verses 23. Now, these verses that we're about to encounter today are verses that kind of counteracts when people say these words. When you're sharing your faith with someone and the first thing they say is, look, I, I, I consider myself a good person. That's what they say. I consider myself a good person and they will ask the question, won't that be enough? You know, hey, listen, I'm, I'm not saved, but I consider myself a good person. Isn't that enough or will that be enough for me uh, to be saved? And these are the verses that you can use and show them in the Bible why being a good person is good, but it is not enough, okay? So Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and I'm reading from the New King James Version, the New King James Version. And it says this. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
So we all have fallen short. We all are sinners. So no one can call themselves perfect or good enough without accepting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Okay. So, so no one can say that because the Bible clearly says that all men, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So no one can say, listen, I'm, I'm perfect or I think I'm good enough. No, you are not good enough because all of us have sinned and all of us have fall short of the glory of God. Now, Romans chapter 3, if we move back a little, Romans chapter 3 verse 10 says this. It says, as it is written, that's what it says. So, as it is written, it says this. There is none righteous, no, not one. That's in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. Then again, the Bible is telling us that, yes, we could be a good person. We can be good people. This is true. But it will not be enough because the Bible clearly says that we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Then Romans chapter 3, which is our next verse, when you're speaking with somebody or you're talking with them, and it says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. No, not one. Only Jesus Christ. Only Jesus Christ. So then after you explain that, you go to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. This is the third verse in our Romans road of salvation. So you have explained that all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's nothing to be ashamed about that. The Bible tells us that's, that we are, you know, we are born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So this is just truth. That's all it is. And then you can go on in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, and tell them that there is no righteous person, not, not one, not one that's been born from the beginning of time to where we are at this point today. So there is no person that can say, hey, listen, I can get into heaven or I can live eternity with God just by my good uh, uh, behavior or my, my good works because it says there is none righteous, no, not one. Now, our third verse in our Romans road of salvation, and we're dealing right now with the topic, somebody saying, if you're trying to share your faith and they say, hey, listen, I don't need all that. I'm a good person. You know, and they might ask the question, hey, isn't that enough? You know, being a good person, I think that's enough. No, it's not. And that's what you have to tell them. No, being a good person or your good works or the good things that you do is not enough for salvation, amen, for eternal life with Jesus Christ in heaven with God. So Romans chapter 5, verse 12, turn to that one. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, and it says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, not some, but all men, because all sin. This is what the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse is 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus spread to all men. All men, not some. Now, understand something. God the creator, the supreme ruler and creator of heaven and earth in the universe, God is holy. Understand this. He is holy. God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. Okay? He has set laws in place. Because he is holy, God has set laws in place for his creation to obey. And you might ask, what are these laws? the beginning was in the Ten Commandments, you know, right in the Old Testament. If you want to see them, you can go to the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. Why, you know, and, and why you might consider yourself, check this out, 
you may consider yourself good, right? Compared to most people. I'm not a murderer, I'm not a killer, I'm not a rapist, I'm not a thief. You might say, hey, listen, I'm, I'm good. I think I'm really good compared to most people. But how do you measure up against God's law or God's word? Amen? How, you know, you can just, really, you can think about it growing up. Have you ever told the smallest lie? Probably so. Have you ever took the smallest thing? Probably so, right? You know, then you either a liar, a thief, or a deceiver, or um, a fornicator, or whatever you, the situation may be. But the Bible tells us for whoever keeps the whole law, this is what the Bible says, and yet stumbles at just one point, is guilty of breaking all the laws. That's in James chapter, I think it's James chapter 2, verse 10. It says, for whoever keeps the whole law, you understand? And yet you stumble at just one point. That's it. You keep the whole law, the whole, you keep the whole thing, and you stumble at one point, you are guilty of breaking all of it. All right? That's in James chapter 2, verse 10. That's the disobedience of sin. You know, that's the disobedience of, of sin. So we all are sinners. We all are sinners saved by grace. We all are sinners. Nobody is perfect, nobody is holy, nobody is righteous before they give their life to Christ. They are all, we are all sinners, okay? Now, a person may ask this question. He might say, is sin really that big of a deal? You know, you know and they'll say this, and it's been said before, is sin that big of a deal, and if it is, what hope do we have if we are sinners? Because that's what they're going to say. When you speak to them about being a sinner and you go through the Romans road of, 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 of uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, and then tell them about Romans chapter 3, verse 10, and then Romans chapter 5, verse 12, when you go through all that, people might say, you know, is sin that big of a deal? And if sin is, what hope do we have? And this is the hope. If you turn with me to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Because once you tell a person the three verses that we spoke of earlier in our first step, uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of God. Then you go and tell him about Romans chapter 3, verse 10. There is none righteous, no, not one. And then you go to Romans chapter 5, verse 12, and tell them, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. Once you go through that, people will feel kind of hopeless. Like, well, if, if that's the case, then what hope is there for us? And that's when you go to this text. Turn with me to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. And you tell him this. This is, this is the hope. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You understand? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Understand something. Disobedience to an a, 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 a eternal God that de deserves an eternal consequence, straight up. Disobedience to an, a, an eternal God will deserve eternal consequences. All right? That's why it says, for the wages of sin is death, but then it goes on and says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God shows us his character in this text and his laws in creation, the world, you know, that is around us, all right? He has also written his laws in our hearts. Every person that is born in this world have his laws written in their hearts. 
and in their conscience. Did you know that? Every person knows when they're doing wrong. They can feel it because God has written his laws right in your heart, right in your heart. And that's the conscience that you have. Even though you do sin, even though you act on sin or you think about sin, he still has written that in your heart that you will feel when you know that you're committing sin. When you, when you, you can feel and know that you are committing an act against God himself. He also give us his word, and that's the Bible. That's why it's so important to read the Bible, of, you know, and, and read the word and study and, med- and meditate on that word. That's why it tells you to meditate day and night because it's so very important that we know the word of God so we know when we are committing an infraction to the God that we serve, all right? No good judge would let the guilty go free. Understand this, the criminal go unpunished. Neither can a holy and righteous God allow a sinful man to go unpunished. But God, listen now, God loves us so much. He loves man so much who who the one he has made in his image, all right? And he has provided a way of escape by sending his only son to die in our place. That's what he did. That's the type of God we, we serve. He knew we were bound for hell. He knew we were not going to make it if he allowed it to stay like it was because we all were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. So when we was born into this life, we were heading into eternal death without Jesus Christ. If it was not for Christ dying on Calvary and giving his life and standing in our place, amen? If it was not for that, that's why every time someone tell you, I thank God because I was saved by grace, you should be shouting hallelujah because if it was not for Jesus Christ, no matter how good a person you were, no matter how many good deeds that you have committed, right, doesn't make a difference because if you could not do anything enough to win salvation or earn salvation. You have to receive salvation through Jesus Christ because he died in our place. He paid the price. So once you go through that, once you tell them about the wages of sin is death, but this is the hope, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. Once you reveal that to the person that you are speaking to, the person that you are sharing your faith with, this gives them that hope that even though they are sinners, even though they have been disobedient to God, even though they are living a life a sinful apart from God, you can say, listen, you've committed sins, right? And the, 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 the wages of your sin is death, but there is a way out. There is a way of escape, and all you have to do is accept the gift, not something you have to earn. You don't have to earn anything. You don't have to do rituals and and all those things to earn this gift. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus, in Christ Jesus our Lord. So all you have to do is accept Jesus Christ in your life. Amen. So, once you go through that, once you talk to them uh, uh, about this, now that person's going to, might he might ask you this. He might say, well, listen, how can I be saved? How can I be saved? And this is the most important part of the Roman road in salvation. Now, all of it's important, but this is very important. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. 
And I'm reading from the New King James Version. Once you have shared your faith, once you have explained they were sinners and, and you gave them hope, this is where it all comes together. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10, the book of Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. And this is what it says. Listen to this. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what it says. Then it says after that, it says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made in to salvation. That is it. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. That's what it says. That's what the Bible is telling us. Amen. Then it said, it goes on to say, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and the mouth, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You know, you can, listen, you can never be saved by trying to be a good person. I don't care about your good works, how nice of a person you are, how sweet of a person you are, your reputation as being a good person is, is, is far and wide. Yeah, you can never be saved by trying to be a good person nor can you be saved through the amount of good deeds that you commit. Those good deeds do not mean anything when it comes to your salvation. Yes, it's good to be a good person. Yes, it is. It's awesome to do good works because the Bible does say faith without works is dead. Yes, it's good, but that is not salvation. That is not salvation. Turn, turn with me to Ephesians what is it? Chapter chapter two, verses eight and nine. Chapter, I believe, yeah. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight and nine, and it says, "For by grace you have uh, been saved by faith. For by grace you have been saved by faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Lest any man should boast." I'm gonna say that again. For by grace you have been saved. For by grace you have been saved by faith by faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man boast. You can't brag about your works. It has nothing to do with your works. Basically what I'm saying, or what the text is saying in this uh, Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, nine, it's saying you can uh, uh, be saved only by confessing your sins and placing your faith in God's son, Jesus Christ. That's what it says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 through 10. You only can, can, can be saved by confessing your sins and placing your faith in God's son, Jesus Christ, who died and paid the price for our sins on the cross. That's it. That's it. We must also surrender our lives to his lordship. You have to live for him, placing him, placing Christ in charge of every area of your life because we now belong to him. We now belong to him. You know, both John, both John the Baptist and Jesus uh, begin preaching the word repent. That's how they began preaching. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what they preach. That's what we should understand and know that in order to give your life to Christ, this is a, a, a serious and, 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 and dire moment because the world is coming to an end. The, we are living in the, the last days. And we should be spreading the word, telling people to repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And, you know, people will often ask, well, what, what does that mean, Pastor? To repent means to change one mind or to turn 
to go in the other direction. That's what repent means. So, you know, so how can we be led to repentance? You might ask that question. How can we be led to repentance? The first step toward repentance is true sorrow for what we've done wrong. That is the first step to repentance. It's the first step. The first step toward repentance is to, to truly be sorrowful for what we've done. You know, the Bible says, for godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. You know, worldly sorrow is more like regret, you know, of a criminal who just got caught. We, God, we don't, want, we don't want to be one of worldly sorrow, but we want to be tr with true sorrow, you know, that true sorrow for what we have done wrong, for the sins that we committed, that true sorrow, sorrow, not worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is more, like I said, a criminal being caught, you know, whereas godly sorrow, all right, is deep remorse or conviction that produces a change in direction. I'm going to say that again. It, it, godly sorrow is that deep, you know, remorse of conviction that produces a change in direction. That's what godly sorrow is. You know, and I got to ask this question. Have you, have you ever felt convicted after doing something wrong? Man, I know I have. You know, um, I, I'm gonna even say today. Today I was at work, you know, and I, you know, I was somewhere and I raised my voice. I was on a place and I raised my voice a little bit because I was a little upset. But I had to come down and apologize because I was on the phone. My wife said, "Man, you need to calm down." And I was on the phone. And I raised my voice, and um, I had to catch myself. You know, you, sometimes you are frustrated. Uh, pastor is not perfect. Do, do not believe that. I am not perfect. I am human just like everybody else. And I raised my voice a little bit, but I had to catch myself, you know, uh, and apologize because uh, it's important that when we are Christians, because sometimes we are the only Bible people see. Amen. So it's important that we correct ourselves if we can and have the opportunity. Always trying to correct yourself, asking for forgiveness uh, for sins that you may have committed to man and to God. Amen. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit is one that convicts us of sin. It convicts us of sin. That's what the Holy Spirit does. It convicts us of sin. And write this down. Read John 16, 7 through 8 when it comes to that. Read John. I don't have time to read it now because we are moving pretty fast. Read John chapter 16, uh, verses 7 through 8. Write that down when it comes to the Holy Spirit convicting us of our sins. Now, after we have, com have confessed our sins, we have asked God or Christ to, to, to reign over our lives, to become the lordship over our lives. Okay? Now, some of you might ask, and some, some of them may ask as you, you're witnessing to them, they say, okay, we have went through all that. You talked to me about that. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've confessed my sins. And I, now, did God hear me? Because, you know, people are asked that. Did, did God hear me? Did, did he accept, you know, did he accept me after I went through, or, you know, followed the guidelines of salvation? Did God accept me? Some people might say that. Now, I want you to go to Romans chapter 10, verses 13. If a person asks you, once they give their self, to, they give their life to Christ, and they've went through the Romans road of salvation, they might say, well, pastor or deacon or whoever they may be speaking to, did God hear me? Did he accept me? A lot of times we ask that question. And this is what the Bible tells us. This is what it says. It says right in Romans chapter 10, Verse 13, it says, for whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, 
whosoever, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You hear that? That's it. He accepted. If you called on his name, if you if you call and you confess your sin, he's accepted. He said, whoever calls on his name shall be saved. God promised that all who re, you know received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Right in John chapter 1, verses 12. Yes, God does hear and accept all who come to put their faith in him. He, he, that's, what, that's, that's what he says. That's what he promised. There is no really no need to fear death any longer because Jesus broke the power of death, all right, on the cross. Me and my wife and um, my granddaughter, um, she was a little disturbed because she was speaking about death. And we had to uh, reconfirm to her that because she's given her, his life, her life to Christ and she has also been baptized, but we had to do a, le- a little recon- com- uh, com- conforming to her uh, because she was a little, I don't know what she was going through, but she was, she was feeling a, a certain way. And we explained to her, there is no need to fear death any longer because Jesus broke that power of death on the cross with his own blood. You know, the price has been paid in full. And it is God's promise to receive all who come to him by placing their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. We had to explain that to her and she she felt better knowing that if she if any moment of any time in her life that she leave here and go to heaven, that she will be with God because the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So we, we, we confirmed that with her. And then I noticed that she, she felt better. She, you know, because sometimes kids at that young age, they don't really under, 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 you know, understand everything. But just like I was saying, um, uh, the price has been paid in full. And it is God's promise to receive all who come to him by placing their faith in Jesus Christ as their Lord. It's very important that you tell those who you are sharing your faith with that once they have gone through the Roman roles of salvation or they have asked to ex- for Christ to accept them in their lives, read this to them because they're going to have some questions. Did he accept me? Am I saved? That's what they're going to ask. After, after I did, am I saved? Is, is there, and you tell them, Romans chapter 10, verse 13, that whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be saved. And once you've gone through all this, right, they're going to say, well, what do I do now? What do I do now? Turn with me to Romans. This is our last one. Turn with me to Romans, 10, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Romans 10, chapter 17. Uh, uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, and I'm, I'm still in the New King James Version. Romans chapter 10, verse 17, and this is what it says. It says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith, so f- then faith comes by hearing, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes, I mean, hearing by the word of God. Understand something, your journey as a, a child of God, of the kings of kings, you let them know, it's just begin, it's just begun. You must begin by spending time in daily prayer and in God's word in the Bible. You have to tell them, they have to, they have to, they have to spend time daily in prayer spending time daily in prayer, and, and also in his word. The Bible says study day and night, meditate day and night. So you tell them listening and hearing and being taught and staying in Bible study and joining someone church that teaching the word of God is so very important for a young Christian or a young believer in Jesus Christ. And, you know, you must you find a, a, a fellowship of other believers 
right, of a believer's, a church that teaches and preaches the Bible, not entertainment. Don't go because it make you feel good and you're being entertained and you're walking away with your hands up, throwing them down. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a church that really teaches and preaches the word of God, the unadulterated truth. Amen. This is the church that you want to find, that you know that believes in Bible study, that believes in Sunday school. And you should now confess Jesus, your Savior, before men. That's the other thing. You know, you should also confess Jesus, your Savior, before all men. Share about the new faith in Christ, you know, with your family. You should share it with your coworkers and others whom uh, God has placed in your daily path. Tell them that. That's important. So that, that really ends our Roman road of salvation, excuse me, our Roman roads of salvation. You know, and let me go back so you can write those down. Um, like I said, the first three is Romans chapter 3, verses 23, Romans chapter 3, verses 10, Romans chapter 5, verses 12, Romans chapter 6, verses 23 Roman chapter 9 verses 10 9 and 10 Romans chapter 10 verses 13 and Romans chapter 10 verses 17 this is our Romans road to salvation now I want you to turn with me to Psalm chapter 51, verses 1 through 13. A lot of people, um, after you've gone through the Roman road of salvation, we do what we call a prayer of salvation or a sinner's prayer. We call, it, we call it the prayer of salvation. And this is, this is the first time I've kind of, um, and I, don't, I haven't read the whole Bible, but I don't say pastor, have read the whole Bible, that's not true. And if I did read it, you know, sometimes we do those, read the Bible in one year, you can't remember everything that you read or everything that you saw or heard. So sometimes you'll come across a verse or a, a, a passage that you, you either didn't see clearly or um, you just kind of brushed over. But this, this, this Psalm chapter 51 is a good example of a prayer of salvation. This is David uh, doing what is a sinner's prayer, and I want to read it to you. Um, it's, it's not a long prayer, but if you want to use this as a prayer after you have went through your Romans road of salvation as a guideline, um, this is a good prayer to remember. This is a good prayer or even something that they can read. Amen. This is an awesome prayer, and I want to read it to you. Chapter, uh, uh, what is it, Psalm chapter 51, verses 1 through 13. And listen, it says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. It says, Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquities, and cleanse me, from my sin. And he says, David says, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me against you. You only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Then he goes on and says, so that you are proved right when you speak and justify when you judge. Then he says, surely I have been a sinner, a sinner from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, cleansed with, then he asked him to cleanse me with hasa, and I will be clean. He says, wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Listen what David says. He says, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. 
Then he goes on to say, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then will I teach transgressors your way and sinners will turn back to you. Amen. That is the prayer that David prayed to God when he trans, uh, when he made that transgression against God with Bathsheba. That's in uh, Psalm chapter 51, verses 1 to 13. That is an awesome guide when it comes to a sinner's prayer. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. I mean, when I read this, I had to share it with you. So it's important that we take them through the Romans road of salvation so they can understand salvation and they know what it is they need to do in order to accept the gift of salvation. And then read this prayer, read this prayer to them. It's an awesome, awesome prayer that David prayed to God. And it really covers everything when it comes to your, his compassion and him for him to blot out our transgressions, wash away our iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. That's what David says in this prayer. So remember the Roman road of salvation. I gave you um, the verses. Study those verses and, 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 and highlight them in your Bible or whatever uh, so that when you have the opportunity to share your faith, you'll be able to find those verses and you'll be able to explain them to them. And really, they're, they're all, the verses are really almost self-explanatory too, you know. And then after you go through the Romans road of salvation with them, uh, pray this prayer, you know, show them this prayer and pray with them. Amen. Because not only are we to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, but we're, 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 we're called to lead people to Christ. And a lot of times we need guidance. A lot of times we need a guideline to help us. And this is one of those guidelines to help us. It doesn't have to be perfect, you know, uh, but it's it's important that we use a guideline when it comes to uh, uh, leading people to Jesus Christ. You know, people, it, good, the Holy Spirit will give you the word to say, but you do need to study. You do need to prep yourself. You do need to have a foundation when it comes to leading people and uh, sharing your faith uh, and leading people into salvation. So use this as a guideline. But the Holy Spirit, when you pray to God to lead you, he will tell you exactly what to say, when to say it, and how to say it. But we always, as Christians, must always prepare ourselves for the work that God has before us. Amen. Amen. <laughs>